God calls us to stand out from the world when we base ourselves, our lives on his solid rock that he has given us in or through our faith and calls us to higher ground. My name's Nathan. Welcome to our Riverland Hills online worship. We're so excited for our service today. If this is your first time joining us online this morning, we're so glad you decided to. We ask that you text the word hello to the number on the screen, and one of our pastors will get in touch with you this week and answer any questions you have and serve you in any way that we can. So on August 4th, about a week and a half ago, there was a terrible explosion that you probably saw on the news in Beirut in the nation of Lebanon. And in a country that's already filled with economic instability, government corruption, and the coronavirus, that explosion just helped intensify the feelings of despair and helplessness there among the people. 
But Riverland Hills, did you know that Send Relief, the Southern Baptist Convention Compassion Ministry Partnership, has been on the ground over the past week and a half in Beirut meeting the needs of people? Send Relief has been working through local partners to provide and distribute bottled water, food, bedding, temporary housing, as well as assist in first aid and with medical expenses. And all of that is a direct result of your giving and your faithful offerings each and every week to Riverland Hills. Whenever you give, a portion of that gift is taken and sent to ministries like Send Relief, which are serving all over the world. So as you faithfully give in obedience, would you continue to think about and pray for the people of Beirut and also pray that they would have opportunities to have the gospel shared with them as their needs are being met? 200 families have been served through your generosity and sin relief. If you would like more information on how you can give, you can go to our website and find all the information that you need there. As we continue in worship, Nathan, would you pray for the people of Beirut? Yeah, let's pray together. Father, we do cry out to you for the people in Beirut, and we pray for your mercy upon them. God, we pray for provision. We pray for healing. God, we pray that you would provide resources that they need. And God, most importantly, would you provide people who are willing to share the good news and the hope that only comes through your son, Jesus. And now, Father, as we get ready to continue to sing and we get ready to hear your word, would you speak to us? God, would you challenge us through Pastor Ryan? God, teach us what it means to stand firm. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. is Lord. 
King eternal, we will follow. Well, church family, today I want to start right out of the starting gate with the title of this sermon because it is the challenge to us. And the title of the sermon is Don't Waste What's Left. And that's a challenge for all of us. The remainder of life that God has given us, the scripture teaches us, and we're going to see today how to make sure we don't waste what God has given us and what we have remaining. Um, I hope that this pandemic has put in us an urgency of the brevity of life and has put in us the urgency of making sure that we're living life the way that we should be living life. And, And the best part about what today is is today's a day of fresh starts. Today is an opportunity to start fresh. It's an opportunity to start new. Uh, today's your mulligan. It's a chance when you've messed up uh, to, get a, to get a fresh start and to get a second chance. And um, we're going to look today in 1 Peter chapter 4. And we're going to look at mindsets that Peter wants us to have in the midst of suffering, in the midst of times of pressure, in the midst of times of oppression, in the midst of those times that are so overwhelming for us that many of you are feeling right now in your life that what does our mindset need to be to make it through it? And that's why in the letter that Peter has written to these persecuted, struggling Christ followers that aren't in their homeland anymore, he wants them to understand how they can make it. And so let's start with this first mindset. The first mindset for navigating life is this. It is, I am properly armed against sin. That if we're going to make it, we need to make sure that we are properly armed against sin and we understand the battle that's out there. Uh, Many of us live life as if we wake up every morning and we're walking into a playground or a vacation resort, but what we're really walking into is a battlefield. And that's what uh, Peter talks about here. Look at verse 1 with me, if you would. In verses 1 and 2, the Scripture says, "...since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh..." Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. 
Now, what we need to understand here is, is Peter is referring back to some things he's mentioned numerous times in chapter 2 and in chapter 3 about the sufferings of Christ. Uh, for example, uh, back in chapter 3, verse 18, uh, Peter wrote, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh and made alive in the Spirit. And so what he's talking about here with we therefore uh, arm ourselves, a few things I want us to make sure that we get out of this text and that we fully understand. This phrase, arm yourself, is the same word picture and the same phrase that's used to a soldier putting on armor for battle. So we want to be ready. We want to be equipped with what's going on in our mind. And this is what he says, arm yourself with. He says, arm yourself with the same way of thinking in the suffering of Christ. And so we need to learn how to think like Christ. And that's what he's trying to get us to, to understand. Then it goes on and says, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Well, we want to talk about this for a moment because you and I in life every day, uh, uh, we understand that Christ died for our sins, but we, we battle with the issue of sin. So what is meant here when the Scripture says is finished with sin or has ceased from sin? Basically what it means is that when we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have identified ourselves with Christ, and what Christ came to do was to die for our sins and that it is finished through the work of Christ, and that we have salvation, and we can know that we know that we know that we are secure in Christ. That identifying in the sufferings of Christ, uh, we identify, one, one of the best pictures we have of identifying with the suffering of Christ is through what we call believer's baptism. That once someone has accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, they then are baptized, thus believers' baptism. And what we always say during baptism is that we've been, our, that we've been buried identifying with what Christ did for us, that he was buried for our sins. We identify with that, that we've been buried and we're raised to walk in newness of life. Now, to understand this, this battle with sin, we need to understand what's been given to us in salvation. And so I want to give you just a few insights about your salvation because if we're going to have victory over sin... And if we're going to fully understand the battle that we face every day, the only way we're going to make it is to understand the depths of our salvation. So there's three insights I want you to get uh, that we celebrate about our salvation. The first one's this. First insight is that I have been saved from the penalty of sin. When we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, we understand that because of our sinfulness, that the penalty of our sin is eternal separation from God. The, the penalty of our sin is eternal damnation in hell. And, and that, is our, that is our life apart from Christ. That is our direction apart from Christ. And so what we celebrate in salvation that I have been saved from the penalty of sin when I receive Christ. But right now, today, as our salvation continues, I am and you are, we are being saved from the power of sin. In other words, every day, as we walk through the battlefield of life, what we deal with are sins that are all around us. We deal with the power of sin in our life. And the power of Christ is this, that through our relationship with Him, that every single moment, every single thought, every single decision, that we are being saved from the power of sin that does exist in a fallen world. I've enjoyed uh, many trips to Yellowstone National Park. Our family, we love going to national parks. And you probably have seen this summer in the news of people that get too close to the bison. And they love going to get a selfie with these huge animals that are extremely powerful. And, and you'll, you'll, I've seen a couple of articles already this summer of people that were trying to get a picture too close to the bison, and the bison ends up headbutting them, ends up goring them. All these terrible things happen because they got too close. I was there last year, and, and 
the cars were, were pulled over on the side of the road looking up a mountain, and there was a mama bear with two cubs, and everybody was at the bottom of the mountain taking pictures, <laughs> except for this one couple that came running past us, and they kept screaming, look, there's a bear, there's a bear, and they're running up the hill to a mama and two cubs to get a picture of these bears. Listen, if we get too close to sin, we're going to get hurt. If you get too close to the bison, you're going to get hurt. And we need to learn in our daily life that there is a power to sin in this world. And the only way to overcome it is to understand that it, through salvation, I have been saved from the penalty of sin. I am being saved right now from the power of sin. And I've got great news about the future. I will be saved from the presence of sin. Uh, do you know what heaven is? Heaven is a place that is free from the presence of sin. If you have loved ones that have already uh, gone on to heaven, then here's what you know that they're experiencing. They're experiencing what life feels like without the presence of it. So I have been saved. I am being saved. And I will be saved from the presence of sin. So therefore, if we're going to make it and be armed and prepared with the right mindset, to be armed against sin, then we've got to remember what Christ has done for us, first of all. Second of all, we must remember what God's Word calls sin. Whatever God has said is against His plan, and whatever God calls sin, then we must recognize and acknowledge that that is sin. And one of the struggles that we wrestle with, and one of the reasons why we fall into sin and we let the power of sin take over our life, is because we fail or refuse to acknowledge that what God has called sin, we say, oh, well, it's not that bad, I can get away with that. Or, oh, it's not that bad, I can cheat here or do what I want there. And we just fail to recognize that what sin is sin is what God has called sin. So therefore, we must agree with God. Okay, God, I see what your word says about sin, and I agree with you that what you've called sin is sin. By the way, that word agreement, it's the word confess. And what we do when we agree with God that, yes, Lord, what you've called sin is sin, and I confess to you. In other words, I'm just agreeing with what you've said. So the first mindset we must have is that we must be properly armed against sin. The second mindset we must have is that I am anchored in God's will. Now that verse 2 said, So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. We have to make a decision on whether we're going to live for things of this world or whether we're going to live for God's will. And that's a decision that all of us have to make. And by the way, it's not a one-time decision. It is a moment-by-moment, day-by-day, minute-by-minute decision. Am I going to be in God's will or am I going to succumb to the ways of the world? And, and, and that's the warning that Peter's giving here. There must be a choice that's made. I remember as a kid, when we would go out to the lake, one of the things I loved doing is I was in charge of untying the boat from the dock. And I had learned how to, to tie the boat down, and, and I would go and untie the boat and then kind of launch the boat out into the water. And, and there were numerous times that I would put one foot in the boat and one foot on the dock. Now, you know where this is going. You can only go so long with one foot on the boat and one foot on the dock once that boat's untied, Right? you're going to go with one or the other. You're either with the boat or you're with the dock, but you will not be with both. And some of you, the biggest struggle you have in life right now is you have not made a decision in your mind to be anchored in God's will, and you have not decided that your, your, your desire is every moment, every decision, every choice, every attitude to be anchored in the will of God. A third mindset that Peter addresses is this. Peter says that we must have the mindset that I'm at peace with living differently. And this has been a theme we've picked up on almost in every chapter, is that Peter's telling these Christ followers in a strange world that doesn't feel like Kansas anymore, he is telling them, you will stand out. No question. And we must become at peace you must just, you need to go ahead and settle it. That I'm at peace with looking different, living different, sounding different, making different choices. This is how Peter words it. 
Look at starting in verse 3 of chapter 4. For the time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you don't join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. I mean, you've been there. I mean, this is a common problem for Christ followers that the people you associate with or those that are around you, they're making choices and doing things that you know are against the will of God. And you have to come to terms and be at peace that you're going to represent Christ, that because you represent Christ, you're going to stand out differently and that you love them, you care for them, you, you want them to come to Christ but you're willing to say, I'm not going to fall into the same traps I used to fall into. I'm not going to follow the same patterns I used to follow in life. And, and I'm choosing to stand out, to look different, and to be different. Even if they're surprised and they think it's strange when I choose not to do things that I once did. It's fascinating when you look at the word Christian in the Bible. The word Christian was only used three times in the Bible. What really we were called in the New Testament is that Christians were called disciples. That's what we were recognized as, as disciples of Christ. That's why discipleship is so important. But in the town of Antioch was the first time the word Christian was ever used. And what's fascinating about that is this town in Antioch recognized that people that had trusted Christ and had placed their faith in Christ, that they were so different, they didn't know what to call them. They didn't have a word or a term, and so they used the word as a derogatory term. They used the term Christian, which literally meant little Christ. Now, why were those in Antioch called little Christ? Because they were living their life patterned after Jesus. So that's a challenge for you and me in the way that we live. Are we living in a way that stands out? Are we living in a way that's unique and different? And one of the battles that Christians have had throughout all of history is how do we live our life in the world but not be of the world. And a great way to think of it is this. For those of you that have boats, uh, if you have a boat, you don't want to keep that boat bubble-wrapped in the garage. You want to go use the boat. A boat is designed to be on the water. And so you want to make sure that boat is doing what it was designed to do, is to be on the water. And for us, the water is the world. And, and so that boat, yes, is designed to live and to be on the water. Now, throughout history, people have gone to all kind of extremes. And, uh, for example, the, the monks of the past, that they would go and live quiet, solitary lives away from everybody up in the mountains or in the middle of nowhere because they thought the way they were supposed to interact with the world was not to touch the water. Not to be in it, not to be near it, not to have anything to do with it. But the best way to think of this is boats are designed to be in the water. We're designed to live in the world. But here's where the problem starts. It's okay to have your boat in the water. It's no good to have water in your boat, right? I mean, the minute you let water into the boat, you've got a problem. I mean, you could sink. You could flood your own boat if you get too much water in the boat. And so that helps me to think a lot about how we live. Yes, we live in the world. But yes, we stand out in the world. And the last thing we want is the, the water of the world in our boat because it's going to bring us down. And that's what Peter's warning against. So I want to encourage you to get comfortable with standing out. Get comfortable with not fitting in. Get comfortable with looking different and living different. And by the way, if you're worried that everybody's getting away with everything and how can this person live the way they're living and get away with it, you need to remember what I read just a minute ago that Peter clearly says, don't worry what they say about you. Don't worry what they think about you. Don't worry if they slander you and say things about you. Why? Because they're going to be judged as well. We're all going to be judged. And that's what he says in verse 5. The next insight is this, 
the mindset we must have if we're going to if we're going to have the mindset of Christ and be armed with his type of thinking uh, this fourth mindset is i have unhindered communication with god again Think about how these would apply to life, that it's important that each day I'm armed against sin. That's going to be critical. That's important. And that I'm prepared to live in that manner, in that, that fashion. I, I must make sure that I'm anchored in God's will. Or, or If I don't have that mindset, it's going to be tough. If I don't have the mindset that I'm at peace with living differently, then I'm not going to get the fullness out of life, and I'm going to waste life. And that's what Peter wants us to avoid. But he goes into the next section in verse 7, and he starts talking about communication with God, and we want our communication with God to be unhindered. Look at verse 7. He writes, the end of all things is at hand. Uh, th- this was an, an outlook that he was teaching the Christ followers to have, that at any moment we need to be prepared that Jesus could come back and call us home at any moment, and so we don't want to be called unprepared, but we want to live our life always prepared. He says, therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. That our prayers can be hindered if we don't have the right mindset. One commentator said this, it's only through clear communication with headquarters that a soldier can effectively stand guard. If our communication with God is interrupted, then we're not going to be equipped. We're not going to be hearing from God. We're not going to be walking in His will. We're not going to be as prepared as we need to be for what every day holds. And we'll start wasting life if our prayers become hindered. These words, self-controlled and sober-minded, basically, simply put, it means don't panic. Church, yes, we're in the midst of a pandemic. What's God's word to us? Don't panic. Difficult things happen in life. Don't panic. People will ridicule us. Don't panic. Remain self-controlled and sober-minded so that that communication with God, that our prayers are not hindered. I mean, think about this in our own life. Have you ever misplaced your cell phone? I've watched people go in panic mode. When they lose that form of communication, because nowadays where many of us don't have landlines anymore, the only communication we have with the world is through that cell phone. And if we do misplace it, we, we, we panic. Uh, or think of your Wi-Fi. Uh, you want to know a way to get all of your children from upstairs to downstairs? Disconnect the Wi-Fi, right? <laughs> Everybody panics. Where did the Wi-Fi go? We're disconnected. We can't do anything. What happened? And everybody comes downstairs trying to figure out how to reset the modem because we're panicked. And so maybe for you today, the issue is this, is that we're not going to God in the proper way and we're always in an an anxious panic mode. Now, here's the good news about communication with God. We can bring anything to him. You have questions? Bring them. You have different emotions you're going through, bring them. Dealing with some anxiety, bring it. Dealing with anger, bring it. Bring it to God. Why? Because you want to make sure that you keep your mind in a non-panic mode. You want to make sure you're sober-minded so you're, you're clear for life. How many days do we waste and hours and years even that we waste when we don't have self-control, and when we're not even keel, and when we're not sober-minded. The fifth mindset that Peter teaches is he's now teaching the people how to have relationships with one another. He's talked about how to have relationships with a lost world, but now he starts talking about how to have relationships with other believers, and the mindset we must have is this, I keep on loving others. I must keep on, keep on loving others. And by the way, this isn't easy. There's some unlovable people out there. There's some people that are just tough to love. There's some people that have hurt you so bad, you don't know how you could ever love them again. But let's look at what the text says in 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 8. Above all, 
So there's obviously a priority to this, because Peter uses that phrase, above all. Keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins, showing hospitality to one another without grumbling. Some of your translations say without complaining. Now I want to highlight a word that's critical here. He says, love one another earnestly, and I love the original language because it brings so much depth, but this word earnestly in the Greek, uh, this word is, it was used as a non-biblical word to describe a horse at full gallop, a horse actually that's at full gallop to the point of exhaustion. Now, with that word picture in mind, let me think about how well I've loved people this past week. <laughs> he says, above all, love people and keep on loving people earnestly. In other words, at full gallop, even to the point of exhaustion. Now, some of you, you are loving people and you have loved some difficult people to the point of exhaustion and you're worn out. But others of you, you've just given up on others. You've said, oh, forget them. They'll never change. Forget them. They're, I could never love them. They're, they are so messed up and so unlovable. So here's the challenge. The challenge is for us to learn how to keep on keeping on. I mean, look what he said. He said the reason why this is important because love covers a multitude of sins. You know what love did for you and me? The love of Christ covered our sins. The love of Christ gave us salvation. The love of Christ restores our relationship with God. And so because of that, we have had a multitude of sins covered in our own life. So our calling is to love others in the same way. By the way, this word that's used here is the word agape love. Now, we've talked in weeks past about Philadelphia love, which is brotherly love, which is one word used in the Greek, but this one's agape love, and agape love is Jesus' love. Agape love is sacrificial love. Agape love is when you choose, you decide to love someone, even the unlovable. And friends, this is not easy. But it's the mindset that we must have so we don't waste life. And here's what's happening. For many of you, you are wasting life. You are wasting days with unforgiveness towards someone. You are wasting days hating someone else. You are wasting days carrying a spirit of, re of revenge or, or, or carrying a, a spirit of grudge against someone because of something they did to you eons ago. And you're still holding that against them. Love covers a multitude of sins, and we want to show hospitality, concern, and care to one another without grumbling and complaining. How you doing in the grumbling category? <laughs> Are you complaining against others? Are you grumbling against others? Hey, how about this? Do you act one way in front of someone and then go behind their back and grumble against them? It's got to stop, Peter says. Because people are watching, a lost world is watching, and wants to see how we're going to act. A, a last mindset I want to give you that Peter gives us in this passage is the mindset that I am aware of my contribution. I'm aware of my giftedness. I'm aware of what I bring to the table. I'm aware of what I bring to the kingdom of God that God's uniquely equipped you for and equipped me for. Look at verses 10 and 11. Verse 10 says, as each has received a gift, by the way, that should be tremendous encouragement to you. As each has received a gift, every one of us has a gift that we can use for God's kingdom. And he goes on and explains it. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Now, God's given us different abilities, and it's varied, but it's what he's given to us and what we're called to do is we're called to manage it well, to steward it well is what that word is. Verse 11, whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God, and whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever. Amen. Your gift is different 
And by the way, he talks about two different gift categories here. He doesn't go through all the gifts, but he talks about gifts of speech or talking, and he talks about gifts of service, and you fall in one of those categories. Some of you are great talking with people, and you're great being able to communicate verbally the gospel, and you're great at being able to share biblical truths, and you do great from a talking perspective, but there's others that your gift is a service gift, and uh, this church functions off people who have a service gift. Right now, behind the scenes, people running sound and running cameras and greeters that serve at the door and people that do hospitality ministry and people that work behind the scenes with kids and and people that serve in our community and people that serve in our local schools and on and on and on. Use your gift. And how do you use it? You use it, as the Scripture says, for God's glory. It says, in order that in everything God may be glorified. Do you get this? When you serve, you are glorifying God. Whatever type of service it is, and we are called for God, we are called to glorify God through our gifts and the way that we can serve. And so I want to challenge you to use it in ways that you may have never used it before. The mindsets. We must have a proper mindset against sin. We must be anchored in God's will. We must be at peace with living differently. We must have unhindered communication with God. We must keep on loving others, even when it's tough. We must be aware of our contribution. Hey, every once in a while in country music, country music comes up with some good theology. And there's a little bit of an older song. Some of you will remember it, but it's from 2007. It's a Kenny Chesney song, and the title of the song is Don't Blink. And I want you to hear the lyric to this song. I turned on the evening news and saw an old man being interviewed, turning 102 today. Asked him what's the secret to life, and he looked up from his old pipe, laughed and said, all I can say is this, don't blink. Just like that, you're six years old, and you take a nap, and you wake up, and you're 25 years old, and your high school sweetheart becomes your wife, don't blink. You just might miss your babies growing old like mine did turning into moms and dads. And the next thing you know, your better half of 50 years is there in bed and you're praying God for God to take you instead. Trust me, friend, a hundred years goes faster than you think. Don't blink. The call to us from Peter is don't waste what's left. I don't know how much life I have left. I don't know how much life you have left. But here's the call. Let's not waste it. It's time for a reset. It's time for a fresh start. Some of you need to reset your life by recommitting your life to Jesus Christ. You've accepted Christ at some point in your life, but you're not living it. And it's time for you to make a fresh start with God. For others of you, you need to receive Christ for the very first time. You've not made the decision to place your faith in Him, and now's the time to do it. For others of you, it's taking that bold step of identifying with Christ through believer's baptism, and it's time for you to stop putting that off. For some of you, it's getting a relationship right with someone, a friend, a family member, a spouse, and and today's the day to do it. Today's the mulligan. Today's the do-over. Today's the fresh start. We want to help you in your journey. You'll see the keyword and the number on the screen. We'd love to talk with you. We don't want you to journey alone. We want to walk with you. And so please contact us. We'll get back with you this week. You can do it through the texting you see on the screen. You can also email me at pastor at riverlandhills.org. We're family, and we're going to journey through this together. And any reset or restart you need to make, uh, we want to help you get there. Why don't you join me as we pray together? Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you're teaching us through the words of Peter. And you knew 2,000 years ago we would need to hear this in 2020 in the midst of COVID-19. So, Lord, I pray that we would apply these mindsets to our life and not put it off any longer, but change our mindset for daily living. Lord, give us the boldness we need, and I pray that we would take one or two of these and start applying them immediately so that we can become more like you. Thank you for loving us the way that you do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.